What's up everyone, Charlie here. I wanted to go over some things that I've talked about last year that's very relevant to what's about to happen this year, and it is a hostile takeover on Wall Street. Um, a lot of industry participants oppose this, and it is in relation to the enhanced capital requirements that we just got confirmation that will be in effect this August, and there will be a grace period of 90 days until October of this year, but essentially the industry is gonna need to be prepared by August for what's coming down the pipe. Now, real quick, I, I did make a video on this before. If you would like to watch it to get a um, you know backstory on what this means, I'm gonna cover some of it in this video, but I go in more detail in the breaking enhanced capital requirements video that I made last year. Now, the summary of this new proposal essentially is on its face, the new capital requirements under this proposed rule change are extreme. It proposes a between a 200% and a 1,000% increase in a U.S. broker-dealer applicant or member's capital requirements. Under this change, purely self-clearing broker-dealers would see their excess net capital requirements increase from 500000 to as much as $5 million, and broker-dealers who clear for others would see their excess net capital requirements increase from $1 million to as much as $10 million if their so-called value-at-risk tier exceeds the very low sum of $500,000. Now, the value-at-risk, or VAR, is what is referred to. You may have heard it before. VAR model <clears throat> receives a vague and perfunctory single-sentence description in the proposed rule change, which is, quote, the VAR tier in the table is based on the daily volatility component of a member's net unsettled positions calculated at the start of each business day, pursuant to procedure XV of the rules as part of the member's daily required fund deposit, unquote. NSCC makes no effort to establish why it would be appropriate to use the VAR model, which NSCC uses to calculate and impose margin on trading activity to determine the minimum excess net capital requirements for membership or how it determined the tier amounts nor does it does NSCC offer any reasoned explanation for why the onerous margin charges NSCC already imposes on trading, of which volatility is the single greatest component, are not more than sufficient to cover NSCC's asserted central counterparty risk. So there's two things going on here. Number one, the sum of the broker dealers on the smaller scale clearly have no clue as to what's going on on the broader scale. And the other thing is they're all pointing towards this proposal being discriminatory against smaller broker dealers. And basically they say that the solution to this, rather than increasing capital requirements, is to shorten the settlement cycle, which NSCC, DTCC already plans to do. Let's get into some comments now on this proposed rule filing. This is one from, let's see here, this is from a clearing firm, I believe, a small clearing firm that deals in over-the-counter securities. Um, this is actually a lawyer representing them, so this is how it reads. I represent an introducing broker-dealer, which provides brokerages services in large part to holders of micro-cap or over-the-counter stock and a stock transfer agency, which maintains records for many issuers of micro-cap or OTC stock. My clients occupy a unique niche in the securities business. Few introducing brokers or clearing firms are willing to service the needs of early round investors and founders of microcap companies because of the intense regulatory scrutiny and labor intensive processes that are required. My client prides itself in its ability to provide its customers base with an avenue to deposit and liquidate microcap securities and OTC stocks and make markets in those same securities. The transfer agent client likewise provides transfer services to those companies which are emerging because of the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act of 2012, or Jobs Act, which is a law intended to encourage funding of United States small businesses by easing various securities regulations. I submit this comment letter in response to the National Securities Clearing Corporation's proposed rule seeking extraordinary increase in the capital requirements for the broker-dealer members. The proposed rule change, if implemented, would have the direct effect of eliminating small clearing firms, especially those that service emerging markets, such as microcap and OTC, 
from NSCC's membership roles. Its implementation will also adversely affect broker dealers and transfer agents, DRS people, pay attention, transfer agents, which provide brokers services, emerging public companies, and the public who invest in these growing startups. Now, as been noted by several other commenters, this proposed rule change by the NSCC is discriminatory against its smaller broker dealers, especially those in microcap stock and small businesses by seeking extraordinarily increased capital requirements. It also appears the NSCC is creating the capital requirements in the rule proposed so that they can occur and cover the potential default of its largest member who is placing extremely lofty bets. At its surface, it would appear as if the NSCC is increasing capital requirements for all members because the NSCC has repeatedly fallen short of its cover one obligation as a central counterparty, which is designed to enable, basically uh, the whole point of the NSCC is that they are designed to enable it to cover potential losses resulting from the failure of the member or member family to which it has the largest credit exposure. The NSCC is allowing its largest member to make such lofty bets that they have failed to have the required liquid capital to cover the potential default of those bets five times from January 2021 to September of 2021. So basically within that time frame, the NSCC failed to cover losses in these situations because it did not have enough liquid capital. In quarter one of 2021, the NSCC faced a worst case hypothetical loss of roughly $40.7 billion, which was $591 million more than the NSCC had set aside to cover these worst case hypothetical losses, meaning NSCC members would be responsible for covering the additional losses had the member defaulted on its own credit exposure. In June 2021, the NSCC was caught short of its cover one obligation again, twice. On one of the occasions, the NSCC found themselves to be short by roughly $1.02 billion. The other date was short $5.1 billion. It should not be the requirement of smaller members to foot the bill for these wagers should the exposures turn sour. It should also not be the requirement of smaller broker-dealers to put in such an extreme amount of additional capital so that the largest NSCC members can continue making even loftier bets. NSCC 2021-005 helped with the NSCC's liquidity issues in June of 2021 by requiring that all members have their minimum required fund deposit raised from $10,000 to $250,000. One would think this would give NSCC enough liquid capital to cover the largest members' exposures, but they would be wrong because in July of 2021 and September of 2021, the NSCC found themselves again short of the cover one obligation this time by $594 million and $32.7 million, respectively. So basically, all this rule is doing is allowing the biggest members, biggest players, to place even loftier bets as they absorb the client assets from any smaller broker-dealers who are unable to meet extraordinary capital requirements within the proposal. This is what I've been saying for the last two years. Now, this one right here is pretty interesting. This is from uh, a company called Watchell & Co. Basically, real risk also results from too much borrowed money. Um, they're disagreeing with the NSCC on their assessment of what risk means. They believe that they got the definition of risk wrong, but basically they believe that the new minimum excess net capital matrix for small firms demonstrates NSCC's misunderstanding of risk. NSCC has argued that the agency trades versus prop trades have the same degree of risk to a firm, and this company disagrees. NSCC states that even if business models had varying degrees of risk, it is beyond their ability to know their firms. This is extremely disturbing that the experts at NSCC claim to be unable to develop a true quantification of risk based on actual risk factors and rely on that alleged inability to justify eviscerating small firms. <laughs> they're going to be eviscerating them. That's what they're doing. This approach should be rejected by the commission in its entirety. Finally, the likely impact of the proposed rules is that small firms will increase leverage, which they have done, or be forced to consolidate 
while discouraging the entry of new firms. All of this lessens competition and increases risk to everyone in the system. Thus, the proposal, in addition to being unfounded and discriminatory, is counterproductive towards the end that it purposes to achieve. So, basically, I have one more here to read. Um, you know, people aren't happy about this. The smaller players, they're unhappy about it. But I, I don't think they're, you know, fully aware of what's going on on a broader macroeconomic scale. They could be, but likely not, because they're suggesting a T plus one or T plus zero settlement cycle. Most of them are in these comments that are already in the works. That's the common underlying solution to all of these comments against this capital requirement is a shortened cycle, which is already in the works. But the disturbing thing, in my opinion, <clears throat> is that the solution clearly is the settlement cycle, right? But what they're doing is there's no way in hell they're going to shorten the cycle before they get all this approved because they're going to want those assets. They're going to want those failures. They're going to want those eviscerated smaller players so they can take in the assets, which will reduce their risk come settlement day. Now, again, this proposal has already been approved. It's going to be approved and in effect in August of this year. Now, on that note, I want you to take a look at this inflation table from 2019. Now, the boxes that are highlighted is the months that the stimulus checks went out to the American public. Now, what's interesting about this is that during this time period, the supplemental leverage ratio, which freed up big players' bank capital and allowed them to continue lending to risky companies, that went into effect the same month as the first stimulus check went out. Or, I'm sorry, it went into effect the month before. So, basically, your SLR was active from this point here. When we had 0.3, the lowest inflation we have had on this entire board, that's when it went into effect. And then it ended right here in April of 2021. Now, what do you notice about that? The stimulus checks only went out during the time the SLR was active. And something else you'll notice is that when it, the second the SLR expired, what happened? The repo started going up in, in demand. Big dick time. Like big time. Never before seen in history. So all of these people claiming that this is like 2008, this is nowhere even near 2008. The Fed is not the lender of last resort right now. They're the buyer of last resort. What are they buying? They're buying dog shit. They're buying dog shit. Now, when we continue on, after SLR expires in 2021, when we have 4.2 inflation, then we see inflation just take off, right? Why is that? Because of rate hikes. Rate hikes started occurring in July of 2021. Since then, we haven't really turned back. So again, this is all engineered. It has been since the start. This is the solution to 2008. This is not 2008. This is the solution in the minds of the Fed and the leaders that are running the show. So before you jump on this bull narrative that's out there right now, remember, <laughs> This is not 2008 by any means, but it's also not the roaring fucking 2020s. Not yet. That's coming later. As of right now, as of right now, you know, Burry said it right. He was early last year. Now he's flipped all of a sudden, which I find interesting. But the big, massive crash that everyone's expecting is not going to happen. It's going to happen slowly over time. Now, how low will we go? I'm not entirely sure, but it's going to be a lot fucking lower than it is now because take a, take, a, take a look here. Repo still sits over $2 trillion. The macroeconomic data that's been coming out has not been good for the Fed's overall goal. I mean, for fuck's sake, their goal for inflation is 2%. We had an annualized rate of 8% last year. And the last reading was at 6.5. Now, granted, it is coming down from the peak of 9.1 in 2022, but we have a long way to go, people. And uh, if we're going to get those rate hikes, uh, you know, 
lowered and slowed down to 0.25, it's going to take even longer. So if they want to get this done quickly, which based on the first part of this video and the capital requirements, which is huge for the NSCC and the bigger uh, risk management systems, they're going to want this inflation down probably by that time, which is probably when they're going to release the Fed now, once they have everything situated, and then the markets will recover. But until then, I'm not buying it because there's zero fucking reason for it other than low volume executed pumps coming from the options market, which is what we saw today. So again, China is going to increase in value while the U.S. decreases. The whole point is to slow GDP growth, but not reduce it or not decline it, but slow it. So, you know, it's a convoluted and complicated situation, but there's a lot more going into this than fucking Twitter posts from washed up people who have no clue what the fuck's going on. So it just, it just makes me sick to see how many people are following idiots online when the reality has been staring me in the face this whole time. It's all engineered. It's all being planned. It's all being set out to eviscerate the smaller players, taking all the risk, have them foot the bill for it, engineer inflation, increase everyone's cost of living to reduce the, the growth of the country because that's what we have to do in order to sustain ourselves because we are in that big of a shithole. It's kind of pathetic. But moving forward for tomorrow's FOMC meeting, I mean, I don't I don't know what to expect. You know, 25 is the expectation from about 95% of the industry. However, only five of the 12 uh, or 13 Fed seats have agreed that, you know, 0.25 is necessary. So what does that mean? The majority still thinks 0.5 should be what is uh, basically put forth tomorrow? I don't know, man. It seems like there's a lot of disagreeing bodies right now, uh, especially Wall Street and the Fed. It seems to me like the Fed's just, uh, you know, or Wall Street is ignoring the Fed, which that could be, you know, a bad situation moving forward. So tomorrow is, uh, you know, it's going to be an interesting day and, you know, go figure tomorrow's my birthday too. So we'll have to see what happens. What I'm personally expecting tomorrow is a shitstorm, but we'll have to wait and see.